Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program, an inspiring conversation with the delightful Emily Dolan Davies. This is my second go at this introduction. I started another one a few minutes ago, thinking I would tell you about the humdrum and mundanity of my day-to-day life. And I thought that would be interesting, but it was not interesting, so I skipped ahead. We're going to pretend that never happened. We're going to talk about Emily. Who is Emily Dolan Davies? Drummer, entrepreneur, leader. I encountered Emily on Instagram. I follow a lot of drummers on Instagram, actually, but I do not tend to follow the super-duper pyrotechnic flashy, chop-a-minute kind of drummers who post spectacular content of themselves playing stuff that I can't even comprehend, let alone play. Uh, I've seen a lot of that. It annoys me. So I tend not to follow those people, but I do follow the working drummers. You know what I'm talking about. The people who tour, the people who record, the people who play gigs... The real pros who are out there doing this for a living. People like Kevin Murphy. People like Sarah Tomek, who's been on this program. People like Emily Dolan Davies. And Emily is uh, in her early 30s now, and she's carving out a magnificent career as a studio player, as a touring player. She's played with The Darkness. She's toured and recorded with The Darkness. Brian Ferry currently tours with Kim Wilde, who is very, very popular over in Europe. Emily's doing it, man. And there's no frills and no gimmicks on Emily's feed. There's cool photos, but there's not a lot of crazy, choppy stuff. There's real practical advice. In fact, Emily not only provides practical stuff on her Instagram feed and her Facebook and her Twitter, etc., But she's the host of a YouTube channel, and she has a program called A Drummer's Guide 2. And what that is, is practical advice on how to be a working drummer. And that's not just about the tangible things, like how to survive a bus tour and not annoy the hell out of your bandmates. But she tackles the mental side of things, too, because, believe it or not, gentle listener... Those people who make it look so easy often don't find it so easy. Now, you'll get no deception from me, because I don't make it look easy. I know that. When I'm out there on the road, as I will be soon, I tend to be hanging on by the skin of my teeth. Or by my fingertips, if you prefer. Emily makes it look easy, because she's a pro. And the reality is, it can be really, really tough. It can be tough as a side player, side player being a hired gun, like Emily tends to be, like I tend to be. My conversation with her was really timely and really, really relevant because I'm at a point in my career, such as it is, where I'm thinking about whether I'm a band guy or a freelance guy. And for me, it's kind of a hard thing to get my head around, and I struggle a lot with some of the mental side of being a freelance player. Now, if you're not a freelance musician, not a musician at all, um, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. But a freelance person is a person who gets hired to play on a tour, hired to play recording sessions, whatever, and that's terrific. And you get brought on, and you get paid, and everything is taken care of for you. And that's all wonderful. But that position can be tenuous. And as quickly as you've been brought on and welcome to the fold, you can be pushed right back out of the fold. Or your artist can decide he or she wants a whole new band, or he or she's going to take a year off and suddenly your gig is gone. Or who knows what might happen. A manager might say, that drummer, he's got gray in his hair now, ditch him. It's tenuous. It can be fragile, and it can be really, really difficult because you build relationships with people, you go on the road, you have intense kind of experiences together, and then whoosh, it's gone. 
tour is over. You don't see these people again, maybe ever. If you're at Emily's level, people can come and go. And for me, that's been hard to navigate. You're a band guy. You're in the band. The band plays you play. You're a decision maker. You might even be a songwriter, as I have been in the past. You have this connection. You have this certainty. You have this position in the project. And as a side player, you tend to be, in my experience, you tend to be kind of peripheral to things. And for somebody like me who tends to commit, who likes to be involved, that can be really, really tough to navigate. And then you have somebody like Emily who will do a YouTube channel about the mental side of what she does and how it can be hard and how you can have self-doubt and how you can have fear and imposter syndrome. I have all those things and I've written a lot about them on my blog. And it's comforting and encouraging for somebody like me who aspires to play at the level Emily plays to know that people at that level have some of the same kind of mental stuff some of the same fragilities, um, some of the same issues that I have, you know? And her advice is great. And as I started listening more and more and more to what she had to say, I thought, I really want to get Emily on this program. So I contacted her and yada, yada, yada. That's a Seinfeld reference. I know there are some of you out there who don't know that and it breaks my heart. Emily got back to me right away because why? Because she's a professional. And she said she would be delighted to come on the show. And I'm delighted that she said yes, because we had a great conversation. And I think no matter what walk of life you're in, you'll find it inspiring because Emily, Emily's had some great opportunities. She'll talk about walking away from an opportunity that most of us would have killed for because she wanted to forge her own path. She wanted to do things her way. She's an entrepreneur. She started a recording studio at home, started doing remote recording sessions for people, has built a thriving business out of that. She wanted to play with a lot of different people and not be tied to a band, and so she's built that world for herself. That's the world she wanted. She made it. Whatever world you want, you can make. This is the connection here. But it's about diligence. It's about taking chances. It's about identifying what you want and then being the best. You can be at it. A lot of side players struggle with this idea of being out. Meaning you're in, then you're out. And for me, what I've had to learn very quickly is that I need to own something. And I've talked about this on other podcasts. One of the reasons this show exists is because I needed to own something that's mine. Something I control, something I schedule, somebody, something that nobody can take away from me like a gig or a tour or whatever. Emily has done that too. And we talked a lot about this. And again, it's a relief and a comfort to know that even higher up the chain, people have these same issues and they deal with them in ways that I'm learning to deal with them, which is really, really great. And it turns out Emily's an Arsenal fan. And isn't that just the topper? I think so. So you're going to love this conversation, whether you're a musician or not. Emily is a great inspiration, and I couldn't be happier that she came on the show to share with us all of the wisdom she has gathered as a professional musician and an entrepreneur. Now, if you're here because of Emily, chances are you come from the drumming world. What I would like you to do, well, first of all, welcome. Thanks for being here. What I would like you to do is take a look through the list of my previous episodes and you will find a ton of drummer content because I'm a drummer and the people I know and the people I want to talk to tend to be drummers too. So you can get interviews with pros like Kirk Dahl of One Bad Son, Jason Tate, Sarah Tomek who plays with Steven Tyler among others, Danny Miles of July Talk, Jordan Gauthier, founder of YC Drum Company, and Seamus Evely, who runs the Drumeo Gab podcast. Some of you, if you're drummers, probably listen to that. Well, you can listen to Seamus' episode and find out how all of that came to be and the amazing synchronicities that came together when he, what? Put himself out there. 
Welcome one and all to this show. And yes, Emily is an Arsenal fan. And if you happen to be one too, because chances are there are some UK people tuning in right now. Episode 12 is with Andrew Mangan, founder of the Ars Blog. If you're an Arsenal person, chances are you read the Ars Blog or listen to the Ars Cast or any of the stuff that Andrew does related to Arsenal Football Club. Please check that out. It was a great one. And man, for now, let's get to Emily Dolan Davies. And hey, Denny, roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I think I finally have Emily Dolan Davies connected to me via Skype. Yes! I hope so. <laughs> Yay! We win! I found out something today that's incredibly uh, karmic and very, very exciting. And it's about you. Oh, Okay, I hope it's nice. It sounds nice so far. I'm scared, though. <laughs> you are an Arsenal person. Yay! Yay! Are you? No way. Are you as yes. well? <gasps> I knew I liked you, John. I just got a good vibe about you. Yeah, I. well, I'm not as much of as an Arsenal person as I used to be. I still love them, and they are my team, but I don't follow them as avidly as I used to. But when I was a kid, I used to want to play for them. I used to train at their, like, junior ground thing. Um, really? Oh, yeah, I was, I was hook, line, and sinker so into that. But do you know what stopped me from, uh, like, becoming a footballer or training and doing all that? Do you know what? actually stopped me what i realized that i wasn't allowed to play on the boys team and all my heroes were guys and i was like well why would i do that i want to be playing next to like nigel keown and and david seaman and you know tony adams and all those guys and i was like oh well that's not going to be very fun i don't want to be on the girls team i don't like girls i like boys boys are more fun <laughs> the arsenal women's team is outstanding they are outstanding i i must agree with you there but i think it was at the time girls were horrible to me and boys were really nice to me so i was just like really? oh, i like boys better they're, they're just more simple and there's no weirdness and they play football and i like playing football so we can be friends and that was kind of my logic at eight years old or whatever it was <laughs> i like it yeah. did you happen to watch the match on the weekend I didn't, but I did see the score, and it made right. me sad. <laughs> You're the lucky one. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I I love them. I will always love them. But yeah, as I say, I don't follow them as avidly as I should. And my husband constantly takes the mick out of me because I always say I'm an Arsenal fan, and he's like, so when was the last match that you watched? And I'm like, um, a little <laughs> while ago. And he's like, no, you're not an Arsenal fan. I was like, I am, I am. <laughs> so, yeah. Is he an Arsenal fan? No, he was brought up as a Man U fan, but Ugh. he's he's not really into football, to be honest, because he, he's just like, I just, my dad took me a couple of times, but I don't really, I don't really, I'm not into football. And then I sort of, I've always said, oh, well, you can just be an honorary Arsenal fan then, but he gets very offended by that, which means that he must be a Man U fan. <laughs> yeah. Such a shame, such a shame. No one's perfect, though. Uh, uh Every time I encounter someone from the UK, yeah, which, which I do from time to time, it it always becomes a delicate thing. <laughs> trying trying to probe. Okay, who am I talking to? And not nine times out of ten, it's a United fan or it's a Liverpool fan. Oh right? yeah, yeah. And I find that difficult to tolerate. <laughs> Are you? If it, if it's ever a Spurs fan, we've got a real problem, but there are no Spurs fans. Um, I never run into them. Oh, well, I've got a funny one for you. My dad is a Spurs fan. <laughs> What? So I know. So here's what happened in our family. My mum has always been a, an Arsenal supporter for all of her life. She used to do aerobics classes down at the club, all this sort of stuff. And ever since me and my sister were babies, she would come into our room at night and go, you support Arsenal, you're a gooner, all this sort of stuff. And when we were about, I think it's like six or something like that, my dad sat 
me and my sister down, she would have been about four, and said, right, so let's talk about football. You're both going to be Tottenham supporters. And, and we both went, no, we're Gooners. And he was like, what happened? What? How did this happen? And my mum sort of like, she was like, yeah, I totally indoctrinated them since they were babies. So good honour is what I say. That's the worst day of your father's life. I know, right? <laughs> it only got worse from there. Poor thing. He's a shell of a man. No, he's not really. <laughs> we love him dearly, but <laughs> poor thing. How does an Arsenal fan marry a Tottenham fan? That's out of Shakespeare. I know. It basically is like the 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 traditional tale. But yeah, I don't really know. I guess it must be love, eh? Although in fairness, they only actually got married two years ago. So maybe that says something. It's taken them 35 years to realise that they should get married after having two children and being together for all of that time and being madly in love. Finally, the Tottenham Arsenal thing gave way and they could get married. <laughs> I'm touched. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> They're the best. So I'm, I'm looking at, I can see you, which is wonderful. On the left-hand side of my screen, I can see calls that I've ended over the past few months. Yeah. And they're, they're all podcast interviews. Cool. One of which is Andrew Mangan. I know that and name. Andrew Mangan is the curator of the Arsenal Ars blog. Oh! <laughs> Do you know the Arse blog? <laughs> yeah, I knew I recognised the name. I'm not an avid follower, but I definitely knew the name. And I was like, why do I know this? That is yeah. so random and brilliant. He was episode 12. Oh, my God. Okay, well, I'm going to have to listen back to that one after we finish this call, obviously. Aren't you? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I love that this is how we're starting out this podcast, can I just say? <laughs> it's like the best start ever. <laughs> I thought our common ground was going to be drums, but in fact, it's football. That's yeah, that's all right. That's fine. I'm happy about it. It's all good. It's a different yeah. different in, and I like it. Wonderful. Yeah. So tell me, first of all, it might be disorienting for you to be looking at my my plosion screen here, my pop filter, but I'm trying to peek around it so I can see you. <laughs> um, tell me about drums. How did this begin for you? Okay, so uh, it began for me, well, I grew up in a very sort of like musical household and uh, my dad played some guitar, like blues guitar and stuff when I was a kid and my mum used to play piano. You know how like every mum sort of knows like two things on the piano? She used to play that those two things every other night and we would always have music on in the house and, and it was just a love of our family, basically. And I tried a few instruments because I knew that I loved it. Um, tried a bit of guitar didn't really work I couldn't understand six strings different notes chords it just was like I'm sorry what are you telling me tried keys for a bit that sort of made sense but it wasn't it was like every kid sort of forced into lessons when you're a kid and then when I was 11 uh, I was just at school and um, there was a note in the register which basically said that uh, there was a drum club starting. And I was like the shyest child you've ever met in your life, 11 years old. And I was just like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll go and try that and see if I like it. And I went and there were like 30 kids in this in this class at lunchtime. And um, I just I sat down when it came around to being my go. And I started doing what the teacher asked me to do. And it just kind of like everything slotted into place. And it was just like, oh, my, I understand this. Like, I can't do it particularly well, but I get it. Like, I, 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 this makes sense to me. I don't know why it makes sense to me, but it just does. And I just knew that, I, I mean, I was absolutely hooked. Even talking about it now still gives me goosebumps on the back of my neck because it was just this instant, like, absolute obsession and just like, well, I'm doing this and this is kind of my life, basically. Um, really? And that was it. It was just, I can't tell you, I've never felt like that about anything before or since. And um, yeah, it was a really special moment that I will, obviously will never forget. <laughs> so did you immediately get drums and begin playing? Or what happened after that? Well, what happened was from that drum club... Uh, it sort of this group of 30 kids kind of whittled its way down and ended up being just me and another girl called Sharice, who is my best friend still. She still plays to this day. She plays with Simple Minds at the moment. She's played with Mika. Uh, a whole really? Bunch of, yeah, yeah. She's out with Kelly Jones from the Stereophonics at the moment as well. Um, and she was the same as me. She was just like, 
this is the best thing ever on the planet. And I was like, I know, right? So at our school, we had um, three drum kits. We were super, super lucky. I mean, they weren't particularly good. They were like really broken down old premier kits and whatever else. Um, And what we decided was we would go and basically bargain with the teachers and just say, so I don't know what their side of the, or our side of the bargain was, but we basically said to them, could we come into school like an hour before school to practice? And for some crazy reason, they agreed to this. And we were like, yay, amazing. I mean, looking back at it, they must have been mental, but good on them. Such, such sweethearts. Um, so me and Sharice would come into school for an hour before school. We'd go an hour at lunch and an hour after school to go and practice, basically, and, and just feed this absolute insatiable hunger for drums. Um, so we, when we started out, we definitely didn't have any kits or anything like that. And I remember feeling like the worst time in the school year was when we were about to go on some sort of holiday, like Easter break or summer holidays, because it meant we wouldn't be able to play drums for like two weeks or six weeks. And it was the most heartbreaking time. It was like, oh, no. So, um, yeah, that's basically how I started out was just playing in school and didn't actually get a semblance of a kit which started out being an electronic kit when I was uh, 14, so three years after I started playing. So I just started in school, basically proving to my parents that this was not a phase and uh, I really was going to do this, much to their pleasure and dismay because I'm sure they were just like, really, you chose the loudest, biggest instrument (laughs) possible. You may as well have chosen, like, I don't know, a harp or something with the size of it, but... What can I say? I've always been a bit awkward. <laughs> That's amazing that you and your best friend both became professional drummers and like high level ones too. Yeah, I we are I think part of the reason that we've managed to be so successful at what we're doing is because of each other because you have literally got the one person there that has done this for exactly the same amount of time you have. We've had very different journeys, but we've always been there as a support to each other. And just, you know, we all have bad experiences in various, you know, musical situations. And and one of us would be like, oh, this happened and I'm really upset or whatever. And the other one would be like, yeah, but it's fine because you can just go do this and we'll make it better and let's do it. And it was this sort of like really great support network between the two of us. And it was like we were on this mission and just egging each other on. Like, we are going to be professional. It's not about if it's like when and how we're going to do this it was just finding a way as opposed to just going you know oh maybe one day it's like oh no this is the only option because I can't do anything else (laughs) so that's it (laughs) so tell me when did you start playing out when you start playing in bands and that kind of stuff? Well, I started playing out when I was 11, literally as soon as I started, because my dad instantly was like, okay, let's get you out some blues jams because that would be great experience. So 11 years old, me and Sharice, my parents would take us to the local blues jams and just be like, right, get up and play a song, get up, play a couple of songs with people that, I mean, we were 11, 12 years old. These guys were like, some of them were in their 60s. To us, completely normal, of course. But looking back, you do just think that must have been such a surreal looking situation. Um, But it was great because it meant that I learned so quickly and, and, and learning how to sort of like lock in with musicians, which was always my thing. I loved songs since before I started playing drums. So learning that, not realising that I was learning it, but learning, you know, working with other musicians was really important to me. Um, and then I started playing in bands as well from like 11, 12. And um, because me and Sharice ended up being the only drummers in the school, we were playing with all the musicians in the school. So whether they were our age or whether they were A-level students, which are like 17, 18 year olds. um, And we would work on all their composition pieces and we would be getting all this mad sort of very strange experience, but very good experience. Um, And then it wasn't until I was 14, it was just before my 15th birthday that I sort of sat down with my parents and I was like, okay, doing all this stuff I'm playing in every band I can with the school I'm playing uh still going to blues jams but I need to have more and they said well get into a band outside of school then that's that's the next step so then I accidentally joined a heavy metal band when I was 14 (laughs) and that's yeah well I kind of how it happened was I was looking online at some ads uh, a version of Craigslist but you know, back in whenever it was, 2000 and something, whatever. Um, And 
I was sort of looking at ran just whatever ads that needed a drummer. I really didn't care about the music musical style because at the time I was playing everything anyway. So I was like, oh, whatever. And um, I remember just sort of like looking through and then finding this ad and it had another girl in the band. And I thought that might be a good way in because I'd feel slightly more safe rather than just rocking up with these random blokes. And they were 27, I think. And like I said, I was 14, just about to turn 15. And I thought, oh, that would be good. And I think my parents were like, yeah, I think we'd prefer that. Just, you know, at least there's another girl there. And if you feel awkward, you'll have like a point of contact and it'll make you feel a bit more settled. Um, and I was like, yeah, cool. And I didn't even look at like their uh, their influences. And it was like, uh, it was like, uh, it, who was it? It was like Machine Head. It was um, Metallica. It was all that sort of stuff. But I'd never really listened to any of that at that point. And I was like, oh, I'll be fine. I'll just turn up and I'll just go play and whatever. So I sort of rocked up and they were so lovely. And I was like, oh, this is really nice. And then they were like, OK, cool. I sort of like set up my, my well, I didn't have anything at the time. But yeah, um, I sort of like sat down. And they were like, oh, do you want to just jam along with this song? And I was like, yeah, cool. At this point, I still didn't know what I was going to play. And then they start playing these heavy kind of Pantera riffs. And I was like, oh, cool. All right. So I just started playing along and whatever and got to the end of this song, this first song. They were like, that was brilliant. Like, can you can you join <laughs> basically straight away? And I was like, yeah, great. That sounds like fun. Like, just so la 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 airy fairy like yeah that's great and at the time I had very like long blonde hair and I looked very young and again I look back these guys were all like tattooed and like dreads and you know they looked the full shebang piercings and uh, and there was little old me just going hi I'm the drummer and uh, yeah and that was the beginning of sort of like playing out and doing live shows with them which were awesome I loved them so much and then it just sort of built from there I, I sort of met a few other people and then joined a few other bands and then ended up leaving school and doing it just more and more and more basically that's that's kind of the short version I guess <laughs> so these like adult human experienced musicians were cool with the 14 year old drummer coming in dude you're as confused as I am right now and I'm amazing. the one that lived it I know how amazing were they to be like yeah okay like it just and actually so the bass player the girl is still one of my best friends like it's just mental I do look back and go this this is unusual like to me it was completely normal at the time but looking back it's like I'm not being funny but if a 14 or 15 year old guitarist came to me and and was like oh yeah I'm going to be playing in this band with you I would sort of look twice you know you would just go really oh uh really <laughs> just even from a, a point of view of going into venues where over here right. you can't be under 18 again I'm not quite sure how we swung that but it happened, and here I am, so I'm so grateful that they did. <laughs> I love this confidence. Sure, I'm just going to go, whatever, I'm going to play with this band. It's I think I, just, I think I just saw it as such a simple thing. It was just, I'm a musician, you're a musician, let's make some music. There was no sort of like complication around it. But again, like I say, you sort of, you live a bit and you look back and you go, oh, that was a lot more complicated than I thought it was at the time. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's mental, isn't it? So you were you were studying at school. Were you taking private lessons at this point? Yeah. So I started. <clears throat> excuse me. I started taking private lessons again from pretty much day one. Had uh, private lessons in school where they sort of had fifteen minute lessons once a week, which very quickly became too few. I was just like, oh my gosh. Then started studying without uh, someone outside of school who got me through. We have these drum grades over here. I don't know if you have that in Canada. They're like, um, yeah, they're just these grades. That they're, they're like musical grades. I don't know how to explain them. I mean, they're not particularly useful in any way, aside from that it was something to work towards. And at the end of the series of grades, you do get this sort of qualification. Not that I've ever used it in my life, of course, but my parents sort of said, well, why don't you do that? It would be a good thing to do. So I was like, cool. And then I started having lessons at 15 with a guy called Mike Dolbear. I don't know if you know Mike. He's... I I don't know him, but I certainly know his name. Okay, yeah. So he's quite a big part of the drum community over here. Uh, and I just got to a place where I was like, I just want to have the best teacher. And it was between Mike and a guy called um, 
Bob Armstrong, who again is a is a really amazing teacher over here. Unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, I think it was two years ago, but he he's big into the Moella technique and all of that. Whereas Mike is a bit more kind of like all encompassing. And and Bob's whole uh, thing was to sort of not break you down, but 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 bring you so that you start off again with a really solid foundation, doing all the Moella stuff absolutely perfect. Um, and I think at the time, like I said, I was fifteen, and I just thought. I was very insecure. As a 15-year-old teenage girl, like any other teenager at that age, the last thing you need is someone breaking you down what little you probably have. And I just sort of like, I spoke to my parents about it and I said, I think Mike would probably be a better fit. I'd met him a couple of times and he was so enthusiastic and very supportive. And um, I mean, I'd I'd seen him at drum shows from when I was about 13, maybe. And every time he'd always have a really, we'd have a lovely conversation and just got a really good vibe from him. So um, yeah, started having lessons with him and that was from 15 and in theory I still do have lessons with Mike I haven't had a lesson for about six months but I he I still consider him my teacher my therapist my guru he just he's brilliant at uh, just being a support in everything that's going on basically I have one of those too do you what's yours I what's do. your teacher's name my uh teacher slash mentor is a Canadian drummer called Dale Ann Brendan Dale and Brendan. Okay. It's a she. she. Oh, she. Love. Yeah. Is she yeah. is she online and that? I'm going to look her up after this, you understand. Oh, yeah. No, I will link Great. you up with Dale, yeah. Please do. I'd love she's, to see her. She's the, uh, she's the finest drummer I know. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting thing is that you started taking lessons with your guy when you were like a teenager. Yeah. And I was in my 30s before I ever took a drum lesson. No way! That's amazing! You do know that my favourite drummers are like self-taught, like learning by ear drummers. So you are already like one of my favourite drummers just from saying that by default. (laughs) Because you you do it with passion from the heart. You know what I mean? It's not stuff that's read from a book. It's like, I'm going to go do this because I feel like that's the thing to do. And I have such admiration for people like you. So well done you. (laughs) That's very generous of you. Well, it's true. It's absolutely. But there, there came a point in my life where I was like, if I want to improve as a player, uh, I, I need to go to somebody. Yeah. And and actually figure out what I'm doing. Right? <laughs> yeah. But if, if you can imagine, I'm in my early 30s at this point. I've got many years of horrendous technique behind me. That's the only and, thing. Yeah. And you're not as pliable at 33 as you are at 14. So yeah. my technique is still pretty horrendous, but what I know about rudiments and technique comes from Dale and oh. and she has remained a teacher and mentor and inspiration and she is definitely has been a therapist for me too. Oh it's like, yeah. Dale, this is happening <laughs> in this gig. Yeah. What do I do? Help me. <laughs> Yeah, it's such right? a big thing. To be fair, I think I think all musicians should have therapists just on call as much <laughs> as possible. But you know, it's just a part of it. We're emotional people. We're we're you know when we we feel things maybe more than some. And and yeah, I think I think it's important to have that support network there because so often you hear these awful stories of people that don't have that support, and then obviously the worst can happen. And and you just think. Why wasn't there someone there just to talk to them and and just be like, it's okay, or help them in some way? So I'm glad that you have Dale, and I've got Mike. <laughs> so. You do, but you you are you are acting as that too now. I'm trying desperately to. Yeah, I I, I started this series of videos um, last year, uh, just over a year ago, in fact, um, called A Drummer's Guide Two, and it basically spawned from I kept having this reoccurring thought where I remember being must have been 13 or 14 and I was at a drum clinic uh, in the UK I was watching watching a UK drummer called called um, Mark Mondesir or Mark Mondesi depending on how you want to say it I always say Mark Mondesir he used to play with Jeff Beck and people like that amazing 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 drummer and at the end of his like masterclass, he said to the audience has anyone got any questions 
And of course, I had a million and one questions, but I was so shy and embarrassed and just didn't think my questions were worthy of his time that I didn't say anything. And I just, for some reason, that thing has stuck in my head for so long. And I thought, do you know what? I want to do something for the kid that was like me or is how I was and too shy to ask, but just is desperate for the information to know how how are you a professional at this how are you touring with Jeff Beck I mean my god that's like the dream you know he's living my dream but I just didn't feel in a position to ask it so I thought let me just share my experience online on these videos and hopefully it can help if some kid somewhere in the middle of who knows where just goes I can do this I can do that I want to do that and then and then I can help then I'm I'm that's me I'm just would be that would be everything to me it's not just kids it's true this is true this is what I'm realizing I set it out with that kind of uh that was my goal but what I actually realized was exactly what you're saying it's it's not just kids it's it's everyone and it's not just drummers and it's not even just musicians I've had so many people who have watched the videos and just said this is so applicable in my life and I'm not even a musician but you know this is I really needed this and and this kind of conversation that's opened up to to kind of realize all these different tangents that are going side by side and and everyone's having such similar experiences but not really knowing if they're alone because I feel like that's the worst feeling in the world if you're going through something and you feel like no one's ever been through it before and no one's come out the other side and and that was a big thing as well I just wanted to be like look you're feeling like this I felt like this you're going through awful things it's okay it will get better you just got to do x y and z or this is more like this is what I did to help me and hopefully that will help you so um yeah it's been a really interesting uh, learning experience about like you say how much it spans so many different generations and and all sorts of stuff i mean i have learned enormously from it because because oh, it's not it's not just it's anybody who aspires to be at the level you're at right and that doesn't have to be kids it can be aging people like me <laughs> or like, like like for example um you know, you did a drummer's guide to bus touring. Yeah. Right? Yes, okay. I did. Okay. I've never been on a bus tour. I've done my fair share of van tours and I've ridden the Sprinter, man. But <laughs> Me I've, too. I've, <laughs> I've, God, I've not done the bus. <laughs> yeah. I not, and I want to. And that's a question. It's like, yeah. what is life like on the bus? Like, okay. But that so, that's part of the thing. It's like, like, I know the first time I went on a bus tour, I didn't want to ask anyone what it was like to be on a bus tour because I didn't want to look like an idiot. Like, yeah. what? You've never been on a bus tour. You must not be professional. You must not be experienced, you know. And I just, like I said, the reason that I did that touring video, uh, the tour bus video, was I was chatting to a bunch of girls who literally the next week were going on tour and had never been on a bus. And to be wow. honest, I was telling them about it more to help everyone else that was on the bus so they didn't do anything to annoy the other people on the bus who obviously have been on buses a lot um but yeah it just kind of opened up this thing of like to me it's normal but like you say at, at one point I hadn't been on a bus and I would have loved to have had something to watch or listen to just to give me an idea and you know everyone's experience is different but simple things like having a day bag you wouldn't even know what that is if you haven't been on a tour bus. But to know that you need to pack a day's worth of stuff to get you through the day is really useful. Also, not going for number twos on the bus. Very important. <laughs> so important. Like the most important thing. So, yeah, I, I'm just, I, I mean, I'm always trying to think up new things to talk about. And um, I, I, it's just trying to see things in a way that my 14-year-old self would have seen them or my 16-year-old self or my 18-year-old self when I didn't know about stuff, you know, and but I wanted to. And uh, so I'm always trying to think of new ways of kind of like expressing the day-to-day the -day things that I sort of like see as normal, but sort of have these moment, lucid moments of going, oh no, actually everybody doesn't know about this and this would be useful for people. So yeah. it's true. It's true. It's easy. Things become normalized very, very quickly, right? shockingly quickly <laughs> right? so yeah. everything seems super novel in the beginning wow and then 
it just becomes normal and you don't even think of you think everybody has this experience right it's like it's no big totally. deal yeah totally and 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 it's that's awful that it becomes so normalized and especially yeah. since i mean you'll know as well as i do how hard we've worked to get to where we are to then go oh this is normal on to the next it's terrible <laughs> we should be here just going this is awesome. Like, this is a me- I'm so proud to, I mean, I am proud to be sitting here right now in this moment. Absolutely. But like you say, you do forget sometimes how, how unusual this life is. I have to, I, I make an active point lately of appreciating things more. Me too. Um, I, I, uh, I did a studio session a couple months ago with a guy and I was playing with some really great local players just in the studio recording this guy's album. Yeah. And, you know, there was a point in life not too awful long ago where the, even the concept of doing that was alien. Like, that, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and then I'm sitting in that position and I'm like, okay, another session, great. And I had to <laughs> step back and go, this Hold is on. really great, <laughs> yeah. you know? So, so, I, so I wrote a piece on my blog that, was called Stay Amazed, I think I called it. Oh, I like is, that. Don't forget to be amazed by all this incredible stuff that's happening to you. So I go out there now, and I do not play shows at the level you play shows, and I don't play to audiences like you do. But I still play, like on the weekend, I played a couple festival shows. It was nice, on a nice stage, which I don't always get. <laughs> and And I made a point of just watching that. Yeah. Just appreciating what I was seeing here and experiencing and doing because it really is a miracle. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. And interesting that you say about, so I find this fascinating um, when you say I don't play the levels that you play at because I don't see me playing any different to you or anyone else like at all in terms of audiences or anything. But the funny thing is about that, my, like so many of my favorite gigs are in tiny clubs have been in like the tiniest clubs where I've just been sat there playing and just gone I'm just the luckiest person on the planet ever and it's very rarely at big shows very rarely because I don't know why it is but it's when I'm in a tiny venue and I'm with musicians that I just lock in with and you know you get that feeling that yeah. you know you know what it is but you can't really describe it it's like that energy that the connection god knows what it is it's in those moments that i just go i am the luckiest person ever and 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 this is amazing and like i say it may be a big show but generally speaking it's the smaller clubs bars covers gigs even i just i just you just sit back and you go this is awesome like this is I'm so lucky. I do consider myself incredibly lucky. Like it's just, yeah. Aren't we the luckiest people ever on the planet? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember that I am. Oh yeah. Uh, because there are. I had that experience. I had this the tiny club. This is amazing experience. Yeah. I mean, I've had it a bunch of times, but one in particular jumps to mind. Yeah. And uh, two years ago, I was playing a tiny little club in Dusseldorf, Germany. Oh, nice. I'm there called... on the weekend. How funny. Carry on. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's so weird. It's it's uh, a, a little jazz club called Emputska. All right. I think that's how you say it. I don't speak German. I'm going to go, yeah, it is. <laughs> and it's a little jazz bar, and they don't have a stage. When it comes time for music, they build a stage by putting planks on top of one of the seating booths. <laughs> Brilliant. Right? It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little place. Yeah. And so you're you're sitting on this fake stage on top of the booth and then the people sit in chairs around you, right? Yeah. And and uh all our gear was in the sprinter and the guy said, I have a kit here if you want to set that up and use it. And I'm like, anything I don't have to carry it, great. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that. And so he pulls out this wonderfully classy little Gretsch club oh. kit right oh lovely it was so sexy and oh. then he's like i've got symbols too if you like and, <laughs> and that's a red flag usually yeah usually when the, when the club has symbols you go eh. yeah 
And so I'm like, okay, let's see these magnificent Istanbul symbols. Oh, I mean. The the <laughs> most magnificent symbols I've ever played in my life. Oh, I'm so, this makes me so happy. <laughs> oh, just like, just like butter, man. And, yeah. And uh, so we set that up and we played and, and it was a small club with, you know, 20 or 30 people in it, which felt full because it was tiny. Great. And we just played this show and it was a combination of those drums and the fact that I was in Dusseldorf, Germany, yeah. <laughs> playing this really cool, weird, vibey little place. Yeah. And it's like you gotta hold on to those things. You gotta Absolutely. not forget those things because Lord knows there'll be lots of reasons to be disgruntled. <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely when you're loading your kit out of your car at three AM or something like that. But those yeah. moments are the special when you just go, This is my life. This is yeah. insane. Like you say, yeah. being in Dusseldorf in a tiny club and just going, what? <laughs> like, I always think about, I think back to my sort of 10-year-old self before I'd started playing the drums. And I just keep thinking, if I'd have told that kid back then what I'd be doing now, they'd just be like, yeah, right. Sure you are. Sure you will be. So it's those moments that are those clarifying moments that everything is so clear and yeah. I love it. Love it. Ser seriously, if I had gone back to my 40-year-old self and said that. <laughs> Shut I'm very... up. I, I, wait. No, I'm... I'm serious. Go on. You, you, you said that you started lessons when you were 30. And even that, I was like, okay, so you've what, been playing, having lessons for what, a few years then? And now you're just telling me back when you were 40. So now I'm getting really confused about your age because you're looking, the music is keeping you young, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> The lighting is very bad in this office, so you're seeing grainy Skype foot Skype images. Well, whatever it is, it's 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 working for you. So, so here's my deal. All right. Yeah. Uh, I started playing drums when I was a teenager as well, cool. and uh, a really funny thing is that when I was about, I don't know, seven maybe, I I was forced against my will to play piano. <laughs> yeah. I, I n never liked piano. Me neither. And, and my piano teacher was this awful old lady <laughs> so was mine it's was yeah. it the same one <laughs> and maybe and she had a, a piano like huge old school piano set up in her living room and it was incredibly sterile and clean oh. and she would put erasers on the back of my hands so that my technique would be right oh my god <laughs> and if my hand was wrong the eraser would fall off i've never and heard I, that that's just, wow so that was my experience with piano it, not my good. whole family my family's musical too we all have it in us but oh cool so when i was like seven some kid said to me hey what instruments do you play man and i said i play piano and drums <laughs> i'd never <laughs> played drums in my life but i love that this was just there i play drums yeah of course you do great <laughs> you manifested it from seven year old to maybe however long it took <laughs> so i was maybe 14 before i actually sat behind the drum kit and I could just play the drums. Amazing. I love yeah, that. Yeah, really, really weird. Yeah. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a great drummer, but I could do it. I had the mechanics. Well, I'm the, I'm the same. I'm not a great drummer, but I get exactly what you mean. It's just you understood it. Your body understood it. It's weird. Yeah, it just, it just made sense. And so I was, I was, so for the next 10 years or so, I was a drummer and I, I was a church drummer, which I don't Amazing. know what it's like over there, but over here, that's actually a thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a thing over right? here as well. Yeah. So I, I cut my teeth playing what amounted to three or four shows a week. Amazing. In this church situation. It was banging too. Like this is the eighties. Oh yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So I I snuck a double kick pedal in. Like <gasps> we, we did Yeah, Heavy seriously. Heavy metal gospel. Amazing. It was. <laughs> That's so the cool. The whole the whole rhythm section was youth group kids, right? We had oh, long hair brilliant. and we it was it was bananas. So Interestingly, cool. I was the first person to bring in the double kick. I was also the first person that they brought in the plastic screen in front of. <laughs> so. hmm, funny coincidence that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So I did that, did that, did that, and then I went off to university and I and in my fourth year I needed tuition and I, the only thing I had to get it was my kit and so I had to oh. sell my kit. 
my God, that's heartbreaking. To, right, to pay for school. And oh. so, but I made a vow, all right? Yeah. My vow was when my student loans are paid, the first thing I'm going to do is buy drums. Yes, love it. And it took almost 10 years. Oh, wow. But I did it. And yeah. then early 30s, I bought the drum kit again. Oh, amazing. And what, the exact same one? Not, not the same oh, one. Oh, I was no. going to say, wow, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> that that would have been a great story. That but would have been. <laughs> it was, it was, we can do a little better than that kit. So okay. I bought a new kit and I started over again at zero. And that's wow. when I said, all right, let's learn to do this properly, right? That's, that's amazing. And so as an adult human, I went off and started taking lessons and, and that led me to Dale. And then I studied with Dale for a couple of years and she fixed as much as she could. <laughs> God bless her. <laughs> but it was another six, probably seven years before I actually started to play out. Wow. That's yeah. amazing though, because you, I mean, you would need so much drive to do, as you say, as an adult. I mean, to me, I'm 32 yeah. now, right? And the thought of starting to learn another instrument from, from zero seems like the craziest thing in the world. Like, I don't think I could do that. So I have massive admiration for you for just going, right, I'm doing this. Like, it's that's amazing. And, mm, and probably, you. actually, all the experience that you had in between in your university and the 10 years paying off your student loan probably actually gave you a really good sort of other string to your bow for music. I'm sure that it's sort of like fed in maybe like in the creative side of stuff, maybe. And just maybe. experience. Just experience. But you know, it's an intimidating thing to do that. Oh, gotcha. when, you're, when you're 14 or 15, it's easy to go hang out with 27 year olds and audition for this band. Yeah. When, you're, when you're 37 <laughs> and, you, and you're like, you feel really weird because all these people have been playing for so long and you have to kind of pretend like you've been there too. You know? <laughs> hey, but, but you're doing it, aren't you? So well, you're funny, proof. Funny things have happened. Like I'm, I'm now a, a touring player and it's like, it's cool. But so we, you question my age. I'm going, I'll be touring in Europe. I'm leaving in three weeks. Yay. September, so uh, where I'm going to be over there for six weeks. During which time I will have my 46th birthday. Shut up. You look yes. amazing. Oh, well, well done. Oh, like yeah. I say, music is keeping you young. So well <laughs> done. That's amazing. Uh, side note, are you coming to London? I'm As in not. London, UK? <gasps> no. No, boo. I will, I'll be primarily in Germany and in the Netherlands for a little bit. Oh, and this is with Sarah... Sarah Smith. Sarah Smith, yes. I yes. have read up on you a little bit, you, you know. You did. No, I'm of course so I flattered. Do. Oh, don't, are you crazy? I'm flattered. You're the one that's asked me to come on your podcast. So the least I could do is just look up about you a little bit. And I loved your, I read your about section on your uh, on your um, podcast page on your website. Right. And I love your whole ethos uh, at the bottom there when you say, if you, like, you basically say, I'm not the best drummer in the world. And if you think that you can do better than me, come do it. And I yeah. love that because I'm I'm so with you. Like, if that is your motivation, if someone sees me and goes, she's not that good, I could do better. Cool, please come, like, do it. Absolutely, yeah. come on, go for it. Like, if that's your motivation, I don't care how it's motivated you. <laughs> if it means that you're picking up the sticks, then I'm I'm happy. Like, it's, yeah, it's so good spreading that love and that kind of ethos. I love it. Very cool. I, I, I sort of... Um... I use this experience as I, that I have as a motivator. I try to. Yeah. Um, Cause I, if I can do this at my age, starting when I did really, uh, man, anybody can do almost anything really. You this know? is my belief because I, I know that obviously I started, well, I carried on from when I was a kid and that, and, and um, from like your point of view, but I feel the same way about me. I, if I can do this professionally, I truly believe that anyone can do anything. I'm exactly the same because like, who am I? I'm just some kid from like North London. Well, I was, I still feel like that kid from London, but I recognize that I'm not anymore. Um, but yeah, and it's just, you know, just perseverance and dedication to something. 
you can do anything. You really can. You just need that obsession and passion for it. And, you know, probably slightly unhealthy obsession <laughs> for it. <laughs> but, you know, we all, we all have our things. <laughs> the other thing that I, I, I like a bunch of things uh, about you and what you've done. Your, your web series, which is now a podcast, right? Yes, yes. I just started that up, yeah. A drummer's guide to... You don't just talk about the practical side of things. You also talk about some of the mental and emotional side of things. And it's really refreshing when somebody like you, with your experience and pedigree, will talk about self-doubt or something like that, right? Oh, yeah. It's such a massive part of, I think, just the human psyche. But as I say, a lot of the reason that I do... I mean, at the moment, I've really been focusing on the mental side of stuff, actually. And I think it's because... I, I just, the more people I talk to, the more people go, yeah, I felt like that too. And I, I did this one, um, this one uh, video about uh, like feeling down or depression and things like that. And I can't tell you the amount of people that have come up to me and just gone, thank you for talking about that because nobody's talking about it. And, you know, anyone, if they're feeling like they're the only one feeling like that or they're alone or they don't know what to do, I'd, I'd like to think that at least there's one video that sort of or one podcast or whatever that will just shed some light that they're not alone this does happen it sucks but you know here's how I've sort of like managed to get myself out of it and and made the best of the situation and hopefully given them some some sort of like hope that not only can you get through it there's all this amazing stuff on the other side of it once you do get through it and actually it'll become part of the reason that you are the player the person that you are although it might be awful now so I just I just think the mental side of it yeah people really like you, you were saying earlier about people not talking about the practical side of touring on a tour bus or whatever people really don't talk about the mental side of it because no one wants to seem weak or as we say, like not professional or they can't handle it or whatever it is. There's all these stigmas. And I just figure, look, I don't care. And if it means that someone watches one of those videos and goes, I'm not going to hire her now. Well, maybe we weren't meant to work together if that's how you feel. And if you can't understand those feelings, then we're not, it's fine. We're not meant to be in each other's like worlds. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, I just think... I just think it's really important, basically. That's that's kind of what... I'm, not that I've got any sort of training. Or this is the other thing I'm really freaked out about, which I should probably do a video about. I'm so freaked <laughs> out that people think that I have some sort of training in these things, which I absolutely do not at all. It is absolutely my own experience. It's my own kind of like just feeling through all the reads and going, oh, well, this kind of worked for me. Um, and yeah, I just, I'm, I'm absolutely terrified that people think I actually know what I'm talking about because I really don't. I'm just saying what happened to me. <laughs> no, but you do. What you're talking about is your experience right yeah exactly that's always how I frame it because I'm not about going this is right and this is wrong because that's not that's not life that's not how anyone should be with each other ever because as soon as you start saying you should I think that is one of the most toxic things that you can say to anyone you should be doing this it's like no go and work it out but here's what I did yeah try that if that works for you great if it doesn't cool try something else and tell me about it because I'd love to hear about it I've written about this a lot on my blog, uh, I've written a lot of stuff about personal growth and development. Amazing. Not because I'm an expert, but because <laughs> I need so much personal growth and development, right? Yeah. So what I'm talking about is my vulnerabilities, all right? My lack of confidence, my imposter syndrome, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the things that I get wrong. And, oh, it's a nightmare. And, <laughs> yeah, and so it's easy to look like you have it together, especially if they see someone like you who's got this web presence and an Instagram yeah. presence yeah. and you're touring with the darkness. And so, oh, she's really got it together. She must be so confident and powerful. Yeah, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. And especially at the moment with the social media culture, you know, yeah. Instagram, everyone's perfect. And, you know, all these drumming videos and everyone is just like absolutely slaying it and, you know, pitch perfect and everything's 
brilliant. And although, you know, I am so lucky to do what I do. And yes, I do post up pictures of me on gigs and they're, they're really fun pictures and I really enjoy it. But I think there needs to be a balance there where, you know, there will be a picture of me on stage all made up and whatever and looking really fierce or however you want to say it. And then next to it will be a video of me chatting with no makeup on, just going, hello, I'm a bit of an idiot. <laughs> and I think that's so important because I am a bit of an idiot, but I can put on a game face, And but I'm human. And I, it's so funny. I was with uh, the Kim Wildlot um, three weeks ago and I was with Rick, uh, the guitarist, who's also Kim's brother, who wrote all the songs. Uh, and he's a guitarist in the band. And we were having a drink and out of the blue, he said, do you know what's great about you, Em? And I was like, what's that then? He goes, sometimes I'm just on stage and I turn around and I just go, you're such a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, should I say that as a compliment? And he was like, oh, yeah, it's a massive compliment, but you are so weird sometimes. And I was like... Okay, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> but it's so important because we all we are all a bit weird, and I think if we can embrace that and be this very strange, dysfunctional family, whether that be a musical family or the drummer family, because I think the drumming community is one of the most astoundingly brilliant communities in the world in terms of support and and just real like friendship and and just being together i you know i think it's just important to feel like you belong as a weirdo and we're all a bit odd here but that's okay yeah that's important you're right it yeah, is it really so, is so this is a potentially an awkward question but what have some of the lower points been for you along the way oh that's a great question that's not an awkward question okay so uh there's been a few i mean so i've told you about the dynamic of growing up with sharice um obviously that was slightly strange at some points because we would be going for auditions which were right there was only going to be one drummer so though those were kind of awkward points where i had to realize and recognize that we were just two different players and different people um but the the biggest uh most awful moment of my drumming career bar none was when i was 16 and i got a phone call from a friend of a friend who was this producer whose regular drummer had broken his arm and they basically said to me look I've heard that you're really good. Um, would you come and do this session for me? And I was like, absolutely, 100%. Yes, amazing. And in my head, I'm going, this is it. I've made it. They're going to recognize how incredible I am. And, you know, they're going to call me for all their sessions and tell all their producer friends. And this is it. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, cut a long story short. Uh, I learned these four or five songs. Uh, went to the studio. It was in, uh, where was it? It was in central London. So it was a big studio. It was proper professional. I was like in my element, set up my kit. Um, and the producer was like, okay, you ready to go for first take? I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. Click comes in and I just completely fall apart. Like wasn't playing along with the click, wasn't locking in with the click, wasn't locking in with the other musicians in the room. Uh, consistency wise, forget about it. That was the last thing on my on my list. You know what I mean? It was just the worst thing I've ever sort of the worst I've ever played. And I was just like, oh, my God. And then in my head, I was like, well, maybe it wasn't that bad, like in the control room. Maybe it's fine. And then I hear the producer on the talkback just going, um, are you all right in there? Is everything is everything fine? And I was oh, like, no. yeah, all right. And then I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want anything changed in your mix? I was like, um, maybe, maybe a bit more click. OK, cool. We'll give you a bit more click. All right. <laughs> should we go for another take? And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, by this point, I know that it's all gone awful. Yeah. Uh, I and then obviously what's going to happen then? You're going to play even worse. So what happens then? I play even worse. And just like horrendous, even worse. And the producer, again, bless his heart, comes on the talk about it. He's like, um, so should we, just, should we just try another one? And I was like, yeah, 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 it's fine. I mean, by this point, I'm a shell of myself anyway. So it was just, you know, this was never going to happen. Um, did this third take, awful. And then he comes in the room and he just goes, Emily, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I'm just going to have to ask you to leave. Wow. Yeah, and I, 16. And I was just like, I, uh, you know, at that point, like you say, I was this 
becoming confident person going for an audition and accidentally getting into a heavy metal band. And, you know, I'd done like a few little EPs with them and, you know, I'd been playing with all these people and I felt on top of the world. And then this moment happened and I just went, oh, my God. I can't do this. Like my when I tell you my heart was broken, I've never known heartbreak like this and like never before, never since. Forget about any guys. No, this was real true heartbreak and um and I basically <laughs> I came home and I was in tears for like I was in tears in front of the producer which was slightly embarrassing. But um yeah, You're I came 16. I know, but at the time, I feel like I'm an adult and I'm doing this and I'm being yeah. a professional and then all of a sudden I'm a little girl and and it was just, it was awful. And then I came home and I was really upset and I basically locked myself away in my room for two days and uh, my mum dragged me out on the third day and just said, right, you need to get out of this room. Let's go for a walk. And I was like, all right, fine. And I, I just sort of started thinking, I was like, okay, there's two ways that I can go with this. Either... I hang up my sticks and then just go, well, I had a nice run. It was fun, but that's it. <laughs> Retired at 16. Right? What an idiot. <laughs> um, or I can go, okay, I can face these things that went wrong head on and absolutely obliterate them to the point that this will never happen again because I don't ever want to feel like this again. Luckily, I did the latter, so that's good. But uh, it was the most heartbreaking, horrendous moment of my life, bar none. Have you done a video about that? Yes, I have. It's okay. called, um, what's it called? Failure, A Drummer's Guide to Failure. Oh, That's what I did. it's called. I did. Yeah, it's, I did uh, see it. it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's the best. It, it was the worst day and the best day of my life because it made me realise, A, what it meant to be a professional and, and the level that I needed to be at to, to do that. Well, it didn't tell me the level that I needed, but it knew the level, the minimum level that I had to over-prepare, if that makes sense. So yeah. consequently, even to this day, when I prepare for something, I do way above what I probably should do but it's the absolute fear of feeling like that again just drives me so much um sometimes in the wrong way as well because it stops me from doing things or it has done in the past where really? I've gone yeah because that fear has just overridden what I feel like I'm capable of however I've sort of gotten over that now and just gone you know what life's too short I don't care I'm just gonna go and do this and see what happens that's what happened with the a drummer's guide 2 video because there was a voice inside of me going first of all what do you know second of all who cares what you have to say and like like what are you doing just stop being an idiot and again the charlatan syndrome thing but then the other side of me just goes well let's just see and here we are <laughs> <laughs> that's that's such a mature attitude for somebody honestly straight up i think that's a mature attitude for somebody who's 32 let alone somebody who's 16 <laughs> oh bless you thank you that's so once, kind once you real once you get to my age you'll realize how young 32 is <laughs> i i i hope so cuz i'm starting to be like huh I'm the oldest one in the bands now, which is uh, slightly weird. Well, some oh, of them, no. not all of them, but Dude. you know. <laughs> that, that's that's going to happen. Yeah. That's happened to me a bunch. So oh, really? I've literally been, you know, I've been on gigs and in bands with people who could easily be my children. Oh, man. Yeah, I haven't done that oh, yet, yeah. but I'm well on the way there, definitely. Like, so it's going to happen. <laughs> you're, just, you're just getting started. Oh, yeah. I've got all this joy to come. <laughs> Tell me about the darkness. Can you talk about the darkness? Of course. What do you want to know? I want to know how Everything. you got the the darkness gig. Okay, what it was yeah. like playing with that band. Cool. And and if you can talk about what happened at the end yeah. or not, that's that's totally up to you. Look, I'm totally open about anything. So, uh, so I love how I got involved with them. It's just such a it's such a modern fairy tale, should we say? So, a few years ago. Uh, back in 2011, I want to say, my sister uh, came out to see me play at a gig. It was just a jam night thing. And um, I got up and played Best of You by the Foo Fighters yeah. and played that. And, you know, it's just it was another cover song to me. So I was just like, whatever. And then afterwards, I came off stage. and She just went, 
you should do that as a as a video, like online. And I was like, I don't want to do a drum cover video. And she's like, okay, what's the number one thing that you keep complaining about? And I was like, that there's nothing online about me and that I don't really have any <laughs> presence. Okay, well, then you need to go do a drum video. So I'm sorry it's not ideal, but just go do it. And I was like, mm, all right, whatever. Uh, so I went and recorded this video. I wrapped myself in fairy lights and, and went and did that. So flash forward to 2014. And I get a random email through my website and it's basically just someone saying, oh, hey, how you doing? Uh, I just wanted to chat to you about a potential project that's happening um, later in later in the year. Yeah, later in the year. Uh, and um, can I just get your number and I'll give you a shout tomorrow? And they signed it off as Dan Hawkins. And I was like, I recognize that name. Why do I recognize that name? And I looked up Dan Hawkins and there were two people that came up. So there was uh, Dan Hawkins from The Darkness. And then there was another Dan Hawkins who was a bass player from a place called Surbiton in the UK. And mm. I, being me, just went, oh, well, obviously it's the bass player from Surbiton. It's not going to be this other guy, whatever. So I was just like, oh, yeah, it might be interesting. OK, yeah, here's my number. Uh, give me a shout. Completely forgot about it. So I get a phone call the next day from a random number. I was like, who is this? So I'm like, hello? And they're like, oh, um, hi, Emily. It's uh, Dan Hawkins from The Darkness. And I was like, oh, hi. Oh, it is you. I, I didn't realise that that was you emailing me. He's like, yeah, yeah. And then he sort of proceeded to explain, we've um, just parted ways with our drummer. We've got a new album that we want to do and a bit of tour. And we were wondering if you would be interested. And I, <laughs> I know, right? And he, And so this was the kicker. He said, we saw your video on YouTube of you playing the Foo Fighters wrapped in fairy lights. And my first thought was, my sister is going to have a field day with this. <laughs> so um, I've now a bit of something about me as well, which I will come into the story later as well. I never really wanted to be in a band because I've always loved, part of the thing that I've loved about drumming is meeting loads of different people, playing with loads of different people, being quite kind of fluid with what's happening. You know, anything can happen at any point and whatever else. So this sort of request of, do you want to be a part of the band? My initial reaction was like, oh, uh, this, this is... This is actually not what I usually would say yes to, but this is such an incredible opportunity. And that first album was so brilliant. And, and you know, they look like fun. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I need to go do this. So I went down and I, I went and hung out with the guys and we played the songs and whatever. And, and they'd sent through a bunch of tunes to learn Um and it was just down at Dan's house and I met the guys and they were so nice and we had like these brilliant chats and then they were like, oh, should we go and play some music then? And I was like, yeah, go on then and and sort of went and played the songs. I mean, I'd been playing, I believe, in a thing called Loving Covers Bands for years and literally the second they started playing it, I was like, oh my God, this is how it's meant to sound. This is amazing. Really? It was just, oh, it was just so full and just per. I mean, of course it was perfect. It's their song. But, you know, it was just one of those, again, one of those clarity moments where I was just like, you know what? Even if at the end of this, they go, actually, no, this isn't right. To have played this song with those guys, that's a life memory that is just, uh, this is a perfect moment. So anyway. Played through the songs. It was really fun. Played through the new album because there were like some demos that had been done at the time. Um, and then we went out for an Indian, of course, as you do. <laughs> uh, and then they basically were like, yeah, like, do you want to do you want to be a part of this? And I was like, yeah, cool. Uh, I've got a tour coming up uh, in when was it? September sort of. Yeah sort of August, September with uh, Thompson Twins, uh, Tom Bailey. Ooh. And um, I said, so I I'm not available until after that. And they said, it's perfect. Like we weren't planning to do it, do it till October anyway. So I was like, that's amazing. So went and did this tour, brilliant, all good. Came back and went straight into pre-production for two weeks for the album um, and then recorded the album at Dan's house with one of the best drum sounds I've ever heard, could awesome. I just say. He is an amazing producer, like amazing, <laughs> so good. Um, so yeah, and we recorded this album and then once the album was done, I'd spent a month there uh, at the house, stayed up there and at the end of it, they kind of were like, look, do you want to come and tour? Do you want to do you want to be a part of this band like as a thing? And I was like, 
yeah, like let's let's go and tour. Let's go do that. So we did this tour of Ireland and that was really great as well. Uh, and the shows were like, uh, have you ever seen The Darkness Live? No, I haven't, but oh, I should. You really should. Like I, they entertained me every night. I was just like, this is, they put on such a show. I You're can't even band. tell you. Oh, such a good band, such a good band, and and some really brilliant songs. And they're so nice. They're, they're. I just got on so well with them. It was just like, yeah, I love those boys dearly. Like I can't even tell you. Um, and then we got back from Ireland, and what transpired basically was that I would have to put them as my only gig, and and they were asking for me to say no to everything else basically and even if I did say yes to stuff if stuff came in last minute with them I would have to drop it and a big part of my whole thing as a drummer just as a human is if I commit to something then I'm gonna do it and I don't like letting people down at all and in my head I'd built up this career of playing with loads of different artists before this point um that I was like I don't want to close the door on that and just become the drummer for the darkness if that makes sense I love the fact that I'm kind of about here there and everywhere with all sorts of people and and I just went do you know what like it's been an amazing run and I loved it I was with them for a year although most people think I was only there for a few months um yeah I was with them for a year and it was an amazing year but it just wasn't the right fit you know when you just go this is amazing but I'm not the right person for you and then consequently they've got Rufus Taylor um who's Roger Taylor's son who is absolutely perfect for them and like he's he could not be more fitted to those guys so it's all worked out really well and really nicely. So I, I strongly believe that everything happens for a reason and all of that sort of stuff. So I think it's worked out really well. Do you really believe that? Oh, yeah, I truly do. Even if in the moment you think this is the worst thing ever that's ever happened, in the long run, when you look back at how things actually unfolded and you just go, huh, well, yeah, because if that had happened, then this certainly wouldn't have happened. So, yeah, there's 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 a few things. Even recently, there's been a couple, which I won't go into, but there have been a couple of things recently, a couple of like potential gigs that haven't worked out that I was like, that I really, really wanted and, and I really thought I was in the line for. But then something else has come up that actually suits me down to the ground and has actually made me address a part of my playing which has been quite weak in the past and now I'm having to make it strong because it's just the way it is so it's actually really good and really exciting so I'm so, yeah. I'm so impressed by that because oh. for a lot of people something like the darkness or a band touring at that level playing to those kinds of crowds would be the dream and totally. I, I would think for you at a certain point, it must have been difficult to make that decision. Impossibly difficult. I yeah. can't even, t- not just because I was there going, is this the right thing for me? It, I know it sounds awful and it's not how anyone should ever think, but I was so aware and self-conscious about what everyone else would think around me and just mm. think, what are you doing? You're an idiot. What are you like? What is wrong with you? But actually, like I say, it was an absolute blessing. And I'll tell you why, because I left or we parted ways in May and I knew for the rest of that year, no one would be calling me because they just figured I'd still be in the darkness and whatever. And she's busy. Don't call her. So it gave me a chance to actually sit down and go, right, what? Because it just brought to the forefront. Why am I doing this? What do I love about drumming? Why have I? Why am I doing this professionally? Like, what would be the ideal situation? Mm. And I sat down and I thought, right, well, I love playing with lots of different people. Obviously, that's why I can't commit to one band and have commitment issues when it comes to bands. Um, I love playing songs. I've always loved playing songs. It's in my blood. Uh, I love being on tour, but equally, it would be quite nice to have like a bit of a home life. I've never really had that before. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's just crazy. Um, And that's when I came up with the thing of the remote recording business and the studio. And honestly, this studio has been the best thing I've ever done for my psyche, for my being, for my playing, for my balance, for just 
everything I just it has actually changed my life and and if I look now back at that decision with the darkness it was 100% the right decision and whether it was or I made it that way is kind of irrelevant all I know is that as I sit here it's the happiest that I've ever been in in life actually so um yeah I I I I'm glad I made that decision and I'm glad for those boys and yeah it's awesome How much touring do you do now? So it just depends. So last year, I think we did maybe collectively four or five months, but sporadically. And then this year, it's been more sort of, uh, we had a tour. When was it? Oh, no, that was last year. No, we've been doing just festivals at the weekends, which has been perfect because that means I get to be in the studio during the week and then away at the weekends. And it's worked out really nicely. That sounds great. Oh, it, I can't even tell you, John. <laughs> it's like the best. I'm like, can every year be this like this? But it won't be. So at the end of this year, uh, this new gig that I'm doing is for... Um, do you have the voice over there? We have a version of it, yeah. Okay, so it's the voice kids, and I'm doing that towards the end of the year. So that's November, December, and then next year will be more Kim stuff, which I can't talk about, but there will be a lot of touring next year, basically. Oh, really? okay. with her. Yeah, so Europe and UK and stuff. So, yeah, um, it just it, it depends. Okay. This is a particularly relevant for me right now because I'm deciding whether I'm a band guy or a freelance guy. Oh, cool. I, I left my band last fall. Okay. That I'd, I'd been in for six years and I was the founding drummer in the band. Oh, wow. But I, I had begun to tour with people, you know, in, in little bits here and there. And it was beginning to affect band life because they couldn't take things because I wasn't here and they needed yeah. a sub. And it, it, got, it got. It's awkward. Yeah. And so um, I'd made the decision to let go of that band for their benefit so they didn't yeah. have to depend on me. Yeah. But I, I like struggled. I struggle as a freelancer sometimes, and it's what I am now. Yeah. Um, I, how do you how do you not attach to the gigs you get? Like you tour with somebody, and then you're out again, and then you're with somebody. Like, you know, it's yeah. I I do know. <laughs> it's um, it is a weird one. Again, it comes down to that slightly strange lifestyle that we lead, and I think. How do I? Well, I used to not deal with it very well. Uh, I was, I enjoyed the thing of having this temporary, fa- temporary family almost, um, mm-hmm. which I really enjoyed because you know, you, as you know, you spend this intense amount of time with people for like you're doing this six week tour. So for six weeks around Europe, and you're like literally family. You will die for these people. You are in the team. We are doing this, and then you get off the gig, and then it's like nothing, and you might not even hear from any of them, and it's like huh uh now what and I used to really really struggle with that and and I I've spoken to a few drummers about this actually but you know if the phone wasn't ringing to me that meant I must be a failure I must not be good enough and my whole self-esteem was tied to the fact that the phone wasn't ringing Mm -hmm. and I I can't tell you well I'm sure you know I, I I struggled so much with that and as I was saying before that's the thing that the studio really helped with because now I I sort of I go on the road we do the family thing it's amazing and then I come off and I do my thing and I can put my energy into the a drummer's guide 2 videos I can put it into the studio and I can just like hone my creativity in a way until the phone does ring again and it's not as big an issue if you know what I mean and an interesting byproduct of that is which I've only just realized in talking to you is that before I would really create a barrier between me and the people on the tour like I would be absolutely friendly and and whatever else, but nobody would truly see me in a vulnerable sort of way or anything like that because I was scared of that moment when we all get put down again and you never see them again. And you're like, I've just given part of my heart and soul to this, these groups of people, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And now what? Like, I'm not good enough and I've been absolutely myself. So I would put up a barrier, like totally guard myself. And it's interesting, as I said, I've only just realized this, the Kim Wild lot is probably the first group of musicians that I've ever been truly honest and open with. Really? And I think, yeah, and I think it's because I have this studio now and I have this way of giving back to people that I'm not afraid to 
be myself with them and to be vulnerable and and you know if it all stopped tomorrow and Kim called us and said do you know what I don't want to do this anymore I'd be sad but I wouldn't it wouldn't be like it used to be and I do know also that I'd still be in touch with every single one of those people because they are just absolute gems of people I can't even explain (laughs) well you know what this is why my podcast exists it it is no it's because my this podcast is my version of your studio amazing as and a, you totally get it as a freelancer i've discovered that you need something that's yours absolutely i could not agree with you more than 100% it's absolutely it took me a while to figure it i had to figure it out the hard way because you know we came off the road a couple of years ago and then there was just silence for months. It's terrifying silence, isn't it? It's really, it's, and if you're somebody like me who's still relatively feels like I'm going to be discovered at any moment as being an, an imposter, like they're going to figure it out. That. Oh, I'm, I'm at the front right? of that line. So, <laughs> yeah. so for somebody like me who, who is prone to that, you know, and then it's like, there's like the money side and there's oh, like, yeah. this is, it's over. Like, that was um, it. I had a good run sort of thing. Yeah. Right. I totally know. Yeah. And, and so that's a dark place. And so I experienced that. And then the next time around is like, I know I'm going to experience that if I don't have something that I control. Right. Because as a freelancer, you don't control anything. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> nothing you are told if you're working on or not you are told where to be you are told what to play and whilst that's wonderful in so many ways because you don't need to worry and you just need to play the drums which is spectacular in itself yes equally they can also say and now you're out but like you say if you have something that you can you, that is yours that is your baby that you put work into and you see results that's going to just lead to a happier, more balanced life. And I truly believe that. And I'm so, it, it's giving me goosebumps now hearing you say this because it's amazing to hear someone else who actually has found this out as well. I feel like it's like the holy grail almost because people don't seem to realize this or they haven't found something in that same way. So I'm so glad that you're saying this. Yeah. Oh, I had to do it the hard way, but it's not, it's not just you and me. Like episode four of this podcast is with a drummer called Jason Tate. Okay. Okay. Jason Tate is a Canadian drummer. He's probably the biggest influence I have as a player. Amazing. He, play, he plays currently with Bahamas. Do you know Bahamas? I've heard of, but I don't know their stuff. No. That's a, it's a Canadian, like they're big in North America. Cool. And so I interviewed Jason Tate. Because when you have a podcast like this, why not go after the people you really want to talk to? Why like, not? Like Emily Dolan Davies. <laughs> he he um, just put out a record like last year. He amazing. he put out like this weird drum record. So he he uh, it's it's a really strange eclectic record, and it's all drum sounds, but it's got like weird effects on it, and it's but it's like it's, he's like he put it out because he needed his own thing. You know, like, that's vital. My advice to anybody who's a freelance musician is have your own thing. Absolutely. I second that. (laughs) Definitely. 100% do it. It will change your life. It will literally change your life. It's so important because if you find yourself depending on other people, there are times when that call does not come. It's a dangerous place. It's a very precarious place to be. So if you can avoid that being your only state, then uh, yeah, definitely get out of that one as quick as you can and get something that's yours. And I think I'm sure that you find this as well. If you can find something that gives back to other people, there's something so magical about that. And that's, that's a byproduct that I did not see coming and has hit me like a bus. And it just, it, it fills my heart every day. I know that sounds so cheesy and I'm so sorry that I said that, but it does. It just it <laughs> inspires me every day. I get messages and I'm just like, oh, my God, I can't believe that I'm affecting people in such a positive way. That's wonderful. And it's, it's, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> I can feel that. I mean, your energy is fantastic, you know. Oh, bless you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> all right. So what's what's coming up for you? I'll, I'll let you go soon because it's been it's been a while here. 
What's and coming up? This is what happens when two drummers talk, you see. We just can go on and on and on. Um, so yeah. uh, coming up for me is it's more Kim Wilde stuff. We just released a live album, so there's a bit of promotion around that. Uh, and I'm still in the studio during the week doing all my recordings, which is great. And then, as I said, at the end of the year, I've got The Voice Kids, uh, which is, is going to be great fun. I'm really, like, just to see that youth and, like, the enthusiasm, I'm go- I'm going to really feed off it. It's going to be amazing. And it's with amazing musicians who I've wanted to work with for like 10 years so I'm so excited um and then next year it's just more Kim Wilde more studio stuff there's going to be some more a drummer's guide to things coming out um I'm working on something at the minute but I'm still in that phase of is this going to be any good and I'm almost at the well just put it out anyway and see what happens phase but uh yeah so there will be something out with that and yeah just trying to sort of connect with more drummers and musicians and generally all that lovey stuff you know (laughs) so the tagline of this program is good things happen when you put yourself out there absolutely so put your stuff out there do it what's the worst that can happen all you need to do is put it out there. If you really hate what happens, just delete it. It's fine. Nobody's going to die. It's only music. True. Or or whatever it is. <laughs> or whatever know? it is, yeah. <laughs> if you find yourself in Ontario, Canada, visiting your relatives in Hamilton. Yeah. I'm interviewing somebody from Hamilton later this week, by the way. Is it it's not Adam E. White, is it? It's it is Adam E. No, it's Shh. not Adam. <laughs> <laughs> He's the only musician that I know that's around there that kind of had some success or something. So, yes, uh, anyway. Who, oh, who lots, is it? Lot, um, lots, lots of great bands in Hamilton. No, it's it's not anybody related to music whatsoever. Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, if you're in the neighborhood, let me know. Oh, yeah, let's go for a drink yes. for sure. We can right. talk more drums and stuff. Yeah, if, you're, if you find yourself touring in North America, let me know. And if and when I make it to London, I will let you know. Oh, absolutely, 100%. I'm gutted that you're not coming to the UK on that European leg of your tour, but we next time. We haven't broken... Sarah has played there as a solo act, but she hasn't She hasn't broken there as a band yet. Okay. It, Germany, Germany is easier. Yeah, Kim is huge in Germany. Germany yeah. is lovely. Audiences are great. Yeah. Like, why would you come to the UK... But it's just full of very judgmental people that just stand there with their arms folded, looking <laughs> like they're miserable. Unless you go to Scotland or Ireland and then they love you. I've heard but that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, I'll come to London and we'll go to an Arsenal match. Yes. Now right. we're talking. <laughs> right. You can, yeah. you can teach me a bunch of cool drum stuff. and then Oh, I don't know any cool drum stuff. I just hit things, hopefully in time. That's all I do. <laughs> it's increasingly where I'm at, too. Yeah, it's good. (laughs) All right, Emily, thank you so much for doing this. This is wonderful. Oh, thank you, John. It's been my pleasure. I can't even express to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and good luck with all your stuff. Yes, same with you. uh, And I'll be listening to all your future podcasts. I hope so. I hope so. And I hopefully will speak with you again at some point. Yeah. All right, I'm going to hang up. Take care. Okay, see you later. Bye. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. Thank you as well to Emily for being such an inspiring guest. If you want to know more about Emily and the rest of my guests, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. If you're a Twitter person, you can find me at at J-W-S Huff. That's H-U-F-F. If you're an Apple Podcast person, please do me a big favor and leave a rating and review of the show. Preferably a positive one. That's all the time for this week, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you. And remember, good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now.
Bianca Andrescu, kids. Bianca Andrescu.